Uh, so I, I view the challenge for me in giving this talk uh, as articulating a challenge that exists for all ocean worlds, uh, and that is, though you are you most easily see what's at the surface, uh, in fact, what you're in some ways most interested in is what's happening in deep inside. Um, so this is a generalized picture um, showing processes that could be happening in Europa, but intentionally uh, constructed to be um, a, a general ocean world. So we want to know, you know, is there hydrothermal activity? If so, is it sermentinization like or more black smoker like? Uh, what are the processes in the ice? Um, how do those influence the geology? What's happening below the rocky interior uh, that also influences the ocean composition? Um, so I'll focus on stuff that's particular to Europa in that context. Um, so the, the 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 map for my talk is to articulate how Europa's surface composition must be interpreted in the context of interior properties and, and dynamics, or to put that in plainer English and responding to Mike's talk, um, the inside probably tastes different. Okay, um, so I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the other thing is we can use forward modeling, uh, so computers, um, to prepare for spacecraft measurements to also understand where lab work is most needed. Um, so again, the, the talks after mine will also be in that theme, and so I'll reference them a couple times. And lastly, I will spend some time talking about how our group, our lab group, the people who are listed as authors, uh, is investigating the thermodynamics and speciation of materials uh, under conditions occurring in Europa and other ocean worlds. All right. Um, so the ideas that I, that I mentioned have been uh, touched upon elsewhere. I just want to highlight a couple of things. A uh, nice paper by Mark Neva uh, with Julie, da uh, Ju Julie Castillo and, and Steve Dash. Um, this figure just, just tries to um, demonstrate the link between geochemistry and geophysics. Uh, how, while it's nice to simulate solid state convection and fluid dynamics and things, these are influenced by uh, the materials that are undergoing those processes. Oh, thanks, Bob. I could have done that for you. Thanks. Oh, that's much, much nicer. OK, uh, another, another way uh, to think of this uh, in the geophysics -y sense, uh, specifically for Ganymede, uh, but this idea also applies to Europa. Uh, if you want to constrain both the ocean thickness seen on the vertical axis and the ice shell thickness, the ice one uh, shell thickness seen on the horizontal axis, uh, you can do so uh, through different measurements, um, if you're just focusing on magnetic, magnetic induction. Um, and understanding something about the ocean's composition uh, that allows you to look at where those measurements overlap. Uh, and so um, that's an example of measurements that are dependent on knowledge of the material properties, which I think a nice exercise for this meeting is to think about what are all of those material properties in the context of Europa. Uh, so I put together this table. I'll walk through it a little bit. Um, on the left, things that we can measure in the lab grouped by sort of themes of, well, thermal and electrical properties, the conductivity of the measurement that came to mind there, uh, rheological, thermodynamic, um, and different um, quantities that one measures in their, their units there. Um, and the spacecraft measurements that accompany those, I, I think rheological and thermodynamic measurements kind of, um, in some ways, are, are coupled. Um, but I, I think this is a nice, nice slide as a discussion point that maybe we can return to, if not uh, during my talk. Uh, uh, other times in the meeting, um, and I'd, I'd welcome side discussions to try to fill this out some. I think this should go into a special issue paper or something. Um, so the things that that um, that are, are most most pertinent, I want to point out that um, re the rheological context. Um, Sam Howell will talk after me. I think that that uh, um, there are things that we need to know about ices that uh, I guess you're, you're going to. You're going to touch on that pretty pretty substantially. OK, um, and also in terms of speciation, uh, what materials are where? Um, Mohit Melwani Daswani will also speak in this afternoon's session uh, after me um, about that. OK, so um, let's see. Going to the next um, sort of part of the talk, um, problems specific for you, or sorry, the first part of the talk, which was what the interior tastes different. Um, so um, I like I like sharing this slide from um, Misha Zolotov's LPSC abstract, two thousand eight, but it's also in the Europa book about Europa's composition. And the point of this, it can be succinctly stated, is simply that um, if you look on the on the x-axis, the the pH is decreasing as you go to lower pH, sulfates become more soluble. And so possibly Europa's ocean started in a reduced state and then became um, 
uh, oxidized as, as the, the flux of oxidants generated at the surface um, uh, was delivered and was not challenged by uh, reductants produced in the interior. Notice that sodium and chlorine are abundant um, throughout that, that uh, process of oxidation. But this is not established. We don't know what is the oxidation state of Europe's ocean. So um, in gross terms, it's, the, it's the, the balance between sodium chloride and Epsom salt. Uh, ammonia may have a role as well. And I don't endorse any of these products. Um, um, but, but understanding the speciation of other materials, the things that are in much less abundance, um, can tell us something about uh, what are the water rock interactions that are happening, what might be the processes that are sequestering different materials. Um, so those, those are all important pieces that can allow us to, um, to figure out more about Europa. Um, and so I added a slide. This is in response, Mike, to your question about the origin of the, uh, the, the magnesium sulfate assumption. Uh, I started grad school in 2001, so I'm a newcomer to this. Um, but, uh, but this is the discussion that was happening around the time that I started grad school. This is the citation in, in McCord's paper about Europa's composition. Indeed, they cite Finale, but I believe that book chapter is really talking in general terms about what the composition might be. There was some lab work um, and some modeling by Cargill, um, which Finale followed, followed up on with an LPSC abstract in 1999. Um, this is a figure from that paper. Um, the, and, and Jeff has given a talk recently at JPL in which he apologized uh, for this paper. Um, it, no, it's a great paper. He, he apologized for the choice that he sees as sort of derailing the discussion about magnesium sulfate versus sodium chloride. And the reason for that is that if you look on the left, um, you can see C3, C2, and C1 chondrites. Um, he chose C1 as, as a low temperature altered phase. It was an educated guess. Um, and as you see in the lower pane, the orguia is, is the C1. Um, it, it plots high toward the magnesium sulfate end. So it, 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 but it's an oxidized meteorite. Um, and so, um, you know, in any model of how Europa formed, you have to assume some starting materials. And C1 was chosen as the starting material. It was subsequently realized, uh, pointed out in a nice paper by McKinnon and Zelensky, that um, that particular material um, was highly oxidized, probably by alteration uh, with water on Earth. And so um, that's, that's a compromised mineral. Um, I, I just I, I put this slide together this morning. I saw that I had highlighted this section from the paper that I put it in. They conclude that the ocean should be sulfate anyway because of this oxidation process. Um, however, that, that, is, that is an assumption about the, the interior processes happening in Europe. But that is an assumption that oxi the oxidants are efficiently introduced into the ocean uh, and the reductants um, are not very efficiently generated. So, um, you mean sulfurs came from sulfurs in the interior? No, no. Oxi o oxygen came from the surface into the interior. Um, they were agnostic. They, they were actually only looking at the, the uh, endogenous generation of sulfur. But then uh, they, 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 they supposed that the ocean started out with more sulf sulfides and then became uh, sulfate rich as oxygen was delivered. Um, okay, so just um, trying to drive the point home here. Um, we, you know, we can look at the surface. Um, we don't know the oxidation state of the ocean. That is the balance between the oxidants delivered into the interior versus the reductants uh, generated at the at the at the at the, the uh, seafloor. I have other work on that topic that I'm not going to talk about here, but feel free to ask me about that. Um, we don't know the fate of clathrates. Um, that is uh, materials that get stuck in the in the um, in the, the structure of the ice, uh, and it's worth looking into. Um, but just, just thinking about this question of, of stuff that's generated at the, at the ice-ocean interface, one might reasonably suppose that solid-state convection or a thin ice shell would have processes that would deliver materials um, frozen in at the, at the base directly to the top. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about that, uh, because that will be covered later. Um, but, but just think about what is the composition of that material that's frozen in. Uh, I want to refer to a paper from uh, Marion et al. 2005, which I'm, I didn't an annotate here, but um, this is my reproduction of figure five from that paper. Um, and so what it's showing is, is a pressure and temperature diagram of a, of a 20 kilometer thick Europa ice shell. Um, and so um, temperature is the blue, the dot, dash dotted stuff is pressure. Um, and it's supposing that the ocean had a magnesium-rich, sulfate-rich composition um, that was described by Cargill in 2000. Uh, and so that's the, that's the box there. Um, and you're starting with uh, freezing in stuff right at the base. 
And then you're supposing that that, 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 that material freezes in, in an equilibrium sense. And then you suppose that you, that you move that material upward through the ice and then freeze the remaining material again in an equilibrium sense. So it's a successive fractionation, uh, but always at equilibrium. And so what they find is that the sulfate, the purple diamonds, is fractionated out. And the... Um, my, uh, I can do that. I was kind of enjoying just sort of lasering with my fingers, but uh, this is more effect This is slightly more effective. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's more effective. Um, okay, so <laughs> sodium and uh, magnesium increase, um, as does chlorine. Okay, so you have a magnesium sulfate-rich ocean that, if frozen into the ice in an equilibrium sense, actually um, leaves a sodium chloride and magnesium chloride signature. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Zolotov and Schock had a similar, this is one of their, the outcomes of their, their um, bulk earth silicate model of Europa. Uh, this is more um, sodium chloride rich, but uh, I believe still dominate. No, it's, it's about balanced in sulfate and chlorine. It gives the same result. Um, that's just a result of the fraction. The, the, you end up fractionating in the same way. Um, so, so this part was something that I, that I did recently. Um, and this is my naive application of freeze chem. If anything, it's pointing out to more need to investigate the workings of freeze chem. Um, um, but, uh, but underlying that is the need for more laboratory investigations. Um, and um, in my table, I cited papers that are, that are doing some of that. Um, okay, but, but just to finish this story, this is the, the final composition from Zolotov and Schock, which was sodium and chlorine rich, uh, perhaps representative of an early Europa ocean that was more reduced. Uh, again, the sulfate fractionates out. And, and then this is seawater, uh, the standard s s a composition of seawater uh, from Malero. Um, again, the sulfate fractionates out. Um, so from that, it would seem that it's hard to get a sulfate, an endogenous sulfate signature at the surface, even as sulfate is the dominant constituent of Europa's ocean. So that, that seems like a, something we, can, we should consider. I should point out that um, these recent papers, Vu et al. and Osgarel et al., um, they examined the trapping of stuff in the ice. Vu were looking at equilibrium ices in the lab and looking at Raman spectra, and they, they saw that sodium and sulfate, so, uh, sodium sulfate was the preferred um, type of, of material that was frozen in. Uh, they, didn't, um, they didn't do this kind of calculation, so there's some reconciling that has to happen there. Um, and those Gurel were doing uh, first principles ab initio calculations. Um, looking at the trapping within the ice of calcium, um, potassium, and, uh, and sodium. Okay, uh, I'm going to get on to the, um, how we can disregard that complexity and instead think about um, what, does, what, what, what can we say about Europa's interior. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I usually reveal this slowly so as not to intimidate people, and usually the equations are not screwed up. But... Um, I will continue nevertheless. Um, so um, we have this piece of MATLAB software called Planet Profile, which allows us to construct simple radial structure models of ocean worlds in general. Um, so this is described here. Um, basically, we know the radius, density, gravitational moment of inertia with error bars of Europa and other places. We know the surface temperature. We can suppose a bottom melting temperature, which is a proxy for the heat flux. And so we can shoot, we can look at different bottom melting temperatures to look at the range of um, heat fluxes published in the literature, uh, the range of ice thicknesses consistent with geology. So that's what we've done here. Uh, and we assume a uniform ocean salinity. So we're not looking at complexities such as um, brine pools or brine pockets in the, in the, in the ice. Um, and it's, it's very reasonable to assert that the ocean has a high Rayleigh number and is circulating really, really uh, vigorously. Um, and so we can also specify a separate mantle heat. We're not doing that here, but it's a capability that we will um, we pu we'll put in place. And Mohit will talk a little bit about uh, related stuff. Uh, and we can specify the silicate and iron core density. Okay, so, so the model works like this. We, we have an, a thermal model for the ice, uh, which has temperature-dependent uh, thermal conductivity. Um, and, um, and then we, after we compute the initial thickness of the ice consistent with the composition of the ocean, um, we then consider whether the ocean is undergoing, the ice is undergoing solid state convection, and we correct for that. And then we compute the adiabat, uh, that's, that is dt, dp, uh, which is dependent on the, the density, the heat capacity, and thermal expansivity, uh, all thermodynamic properties we need to know. 
Um, so then we can compute the temperature as a function of depth in the ocean, which I, I, I can argue is, is the, very, the more likely case than the isothermal case. It's usually assumed. Um, and uh, we don't need to worry about high, uh, high pressure ices for Europa, but we do consider whether there's an iron core. Um, as has been pointed out in the literature, um, the moment of, moment of inertia constraints allow for no iron core. It seems more likely that there is an iron core um, based on what we know of Ganymede having an endogenous uh, magnetic field, um, intrinsic magnetic field, rather. Um, um, so so we, we generally assume there is a core, but, but there are solutions that allow you to not have one. Um, Okay, so th these are the results. And so what we're showing is the density as a function of pressure. And I'm, I'm really sorry, this is a little bit hard to read. Uh, this is going from 0 MPA to 200 MPA. So 200 MPA is 2,000 atmospheres. So that's about twice the pressure at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And um, so just to, to, to summarize some stuff then, um, um, the, this, well, okay, so here's the adiabat for water, adiabat for seawater and the adiabat for magnesium sulfate. Okay, so the densities are, are quite different. We're assuming a 10 weight percent magnesium sulfate, uh, which again references two um, published models. It's, it's, it's not, um, in fact, it references to the figure that I showed you from Zolotov, um, but it's not obviously the set in stone. Um, seawater, we're taking, we're taking a, a clue from Earth here. We also considered twice seawater's composition. And here it's, it's, per, it's relevant to point out that the equation of state for seawater that we're using, the standard equation of state, um, used in ocean, oceanography on Earth, um, breaks down uh, if you consider higher salinities. That is, these are polynomial-based, these are damped polynomials that don't extrapolate well. Um, and so the thermodynamics are um, troublesome in that way um, and should be addressed. Um, this, is, this, this is based on a thermodynamics that we developed uh, using some lab experiments that I'll describe momentarily. Um, okay, so, so I'm showing two different ice thicknesses. So this is the same data in all these plots. Um, so this is now the ice, the, the, this is now depth, 0 to something like 150, 120 kilometers. And the two ice thicknesses that we consider by um, setting different bottom ice temperatures for different compositions are 5 and, 50, and 30 kilometers. Those are decent end members uh, for Europa. And so what you can see from this is that sodium chloride rich seawater has a much stronger melting point suppression. And so um, the adiabat starts colder. And so those oceans are less dense than magnesium sulfate and also uh, much colder. Um, so, so there are commonalities between magnesium sulfate and pure water in the temperature axis, and there are commonalities between, um, well, um, there are no commonalities between seawater in this axis, but seawater is similar to um, pure water in the density sense. Um, okay, and so um, this sets us up to consider in more detail what are other, other properties that we can measure in the future. Um, things like sound speed, um, electrical conductivity, um, which there are limited measurements for those for magnesium sulfate and seawater. Um, that's a, gen it's a really standard measurement for oceanography, but that's an in situ measurement. Um, however, um, if we're looking at magnetic induction, that's something that um, depends strongly on the composition. And so we can, we can hope um, if we have a sense of what is the ocean's composition um, from by collecting more and more accurate uh, laboratory data, um, we can more confidently say that the induction signal that we see is consistent with um, with the expected ocean composition. Okay, and lastly, we can propagate this pressure and temperature profile down uh, through the rocky interior and into the core. So this is just showing the density transition. Uh, we're also, um, you know, propagating the temperature and pressure profile. So that then allows us to consider what is the mineralogy, and we can also consider um, through time how that mineralogy might have changed. All right, it seems that all of my animations are trying to execute now that I'm done. Okay, so zooming in on that interior structure, um, this is uh, just a nice little schematic. Again, this is one particular model. Please don't put too much stock in the 106 kilometer thick H2O layer. Um, if we trace the pressure profile uh, over a range of 1,000 bars or 100 megapascal, um, that is the range of, Euro of Europa's ocean, um, it's important to point out, as Marion did in 2003 in a paper about the astrobiology of Europa, um, that that's well within the region of um, clathrate formation. And so if, we're, if we want to consider uh, what kind of volatiles were generated early uh, in Europa's history, methane is probably one of them, um, and what it was the fate of methane? Did carbon escape as gaseous methane? Uh, we might suppose that it did not. Um, it might have instead formed methane hydrate 
beds at the seafloor, whatever the seafloor looks like. And so that's something, the kind of thing that we can also model um, and also where we benefit from more laboratory data. Um, okay, so exploring material properties this is the last part of my talk. Uh, feel free to interrupt me or to tell me to hurry past the slide because this is our work uh, that may, well, um, I, I guess I, I worry that I'm running over time. That's, that's why I said feel free to tell me to hurry. Okay, uh, the, um, this is actually kind of a profound point. Uh, and so this, we're able to get at the entire field of thermodynamics that I, that I showed in my, in my, my um, table um, by making a single measurement or, uh, or just a few measurements. So we start with the sound speed. Um, and this is, um, this is, this is from a, a paper from my uh, former advisor and collaborator, uh, J. Michael Brown, different Mike. And, um, and um, so the point is that sound speed is a derivative of Gibbs energy. It's a second derivative in both pressure and temperature. Uh, and with cross derivatives. And so if you measure sound speed and you know the integrating constants uh, of density and heat capacity, um, then you can arrive at Gibbs energy. So let me just show you how we do that. Um, so we've been taking measurements in the sodium sulfate system, uh, well, in general, in the aqueous system, um, most of what you saw in the figure from Zolotov, um, and adding ammonia. Okay, so this is a surface in sound speed in, temp in a range of temperature and pressure, uh, the, including most of the range that occurs for Euro likely for Europa uh, and well into Europa's rocky interior. Um, so we, we make a bunch of measurements and then fit a spline surface to that. Um, and so we make measurements at different concentrations, so up to three molal in this case. And so by doing that integration that I mentioned, um, we can arrive at density surfaces at multiple concentrations and um, simultaneously solve for the heat capacity. So this involves some successive fitting to make sure that the smoothness of those surfaces matches what you would expect uh, in terms of the behavior of the thermodynamics. Heat capacity you see has this strong down dip at lower temperatures, uh, which, which is really sensitive to your fitting parameters. Um, we can follow that through then um, with further integration to arrive at Gibbs energy surfaces that look surprisingly flat. Um, but when you take their derivatives in the, in the spline sense, um, you can get back to the original sound speeds in parts per thousand. Um, so these are really accurate ways to do these kinds of thermodynamic measurements. And these are the kinds of data that are the, un that are the underpinning for models like FreezeChem uh, or FreeXC, which I view as a successor to FreezeChem. Um, and so by getting this kind of data, uh, we can address a lot of problems in those models in which some of the, sometimes the activity of water, for example, is is fit to data that are very sparse or very strongly scattered. Okay, so the, the plan uh, is, to, again, to look at multiple different ionic systems. Uh, we've recently completed this phase space of magnesium, sodium, chlorine, and, and sulfate, um, at least the, the pure members, the, the outsides of this, this uh, surface. Um, and so we're beginning to look at the mixed systems. And then we'll have to re reproduce all of this when we add ammonia to the system. And so we're doing that as well. Uh, and so in order to complete that more efficiently, we're building an additional experiment at JPL. Um, so just briefly, because um, I worry some of you aren't terribly interested in this particular kind of measurement, um, the, um, the, um, the measurement is, is uh, done in a high-pressure system that's strongly insulated. Um, and the, the sample is right here. Um, and we are, are, gener are both our source of the acoustic wave and the sensor for the acoustic wave is a piezoelectric disc that's here. So the, the sound wave translates through this buffer rod to the end of the, the sample, uh, and the sound wave is, is then um, generated in the sample, and we, we look at the reflection. Um, let's see, so uh, again, we're building a similar system at JPL. This is a nice schematic that a student of mine put together, um, and so it just shows all the, all the different parts of the system. It's a hydraulic system. We're pushing uh, oil through an intensifier that translates to 10,000 PSI, um, uh, pressure source into 100,000 psi or 700 megapascal. Our pressure vessel is back there. It's a Harwood engineering cell. Uh, we also have optical access in the same system. This is a this is a, a system that we're not currently using, but I used for uh, for my thesis data on magnesium sulfate. Um, and so, if people are interested in doing um, high pressure optical measurements, including with Raman, we we could consider doing that. Um, okay, so. The, here's some data. Um, so again, the, the measurement, the sound wave starts here, goes through the buffer rod. There's a strong reflection at where the buffer rod meets the water because of the density contrast. Sorry, that's right there. 
And then there's a subsequent reflection where the, the you translate transfer back into this reflection thing. Uh, and so so there's the first reflection from the buffer rod. Uh, this is the raw data. This is the cleaned up data. Sorry, vice versa. Um, and then we can see this, the subsequent reflections from the sample. We actually can actually see multiple reflections, so that allows us to improve the accuracy of the measurement. And so we get, again, very, very precise measurements um, of uh, sound speed. Uh, we do lots and lots of these measurements. And so here's some example data. Um, this is a paper that Olivier, the postdoc, uh, is putting together um, for pure water. And the crosses, the, their measurements match very well with the um, one published um, um, experiment in the, in the same pressure and temperature range. And so that, that then corresponds to a paper on equation of state of water that we're working on. OK, so once we know Gibbs energy, then um, we know chemical potential, because we know the derivative with comp concentration. And so we can compare the, the surfaces in the fluid phase with surfaces in the solids, for example, uh, with ice, and figure out where is the melting curve. So actually, only knowing a few points in the melting curve, um, like at the triple point, um, we can pin this, this surface down and really accurately predict everywhere that the melting occurs. OK, so just the last, last couple things. Um, we have a, I just want to mention work by a colleague, Evan, Evan Abramson, uh, also working with Olivier Boulanger. Um, so they're working in, with diamond endel cells. So this is uh, taking two uh, gem quality diamonds that have really flat culets and pushing them together uh, with a sample inside. Here they're looking at the H2O CO2 system, uh, important for uh, mantle dynamics on Earth where subduction is happening, uh, but also uh, potentially in Europa, and in, in, um, it's possible that in Europa's deeper interior, and especially during its formation, H2, the H2O CO2 system uh, would have been really important in uh, influencing the evolution of the mantle and therefore the ocean. Okay, so they, they use these diamond cells to look at the um, equilibrium phase diagram in, uh, in, in the, the system. They, they saw solid phases of CO2 forming in some places where they were expected, other places where they were not expected. Um, and you, it's important to point out that the pure melting line for the, the CO2 and H2O are different, and the mixtures are, are, are somewhere in between. Um, and um, yeah, so that resulted in a couple papers on this, on this topic. Um, so that's just an example of the kind of things that we can do with high pressure measurements um, over a range of temperature. And um, hopefully this will yield uh, more uh, information about Europa's interior. So I'll just end with my conclusions, with which restate my introduction, and uh, happy to take any questions. Questions? Hi, Noah Hammond, University of Toronto. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about class rates and uh, what's your take on like with the latest thoughts on Europa's likely uh, ocean composition, the stability of class rates over time, and yeah. So um, this I sort of you you keep your way because I'll please. stay away. I know. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, this has been considered some in the past, but um, the only other paper I know about Europa clath rates is Kevin Hand's paper from 2006, which is about the stability of oxygen or oxidized clath rates in the ice. Also some interesting points in there that deserve following up on. Uh, but I think, a, a, again, a general problem with um, Ocean World's research is that there's so much work to do in understanding what's happening at the surface that complications like clath rates uh, aren't aren't often considered. Um, uh, a goal of ours is to get um, from class rate modeling into planet profile in the next, within the next year. Yeah. Uh, you, you kept talking about the oxygen getting down to the, to the water, and, yeah. which is be nice. Uh, but uh, if things have trouble getting up, get coming down is not a problem for a gas. Uh, I mean, do you have a mechanism? And we uh, like to think of one because we produce the oxygen with Yeah, plasma. yeah. Um, I've, you know, I, I tend to default to Kevin's papers that, that are, are also somewhat agnostic and say, here's the, here's the range of ages of the ice. And so let's consider that at the, at the end, 
um, the, the longest time scale is 100 million years. Um, I think Sam might have some very detailed comments on that somehow. Um, I, getting through the icy lithosphere is pretty hard. Um, so I have a paper in revision right now where I try and look at some of the internal and external forces that could actually drive things down through the brittle part. And it's pretty difficult even after it's broken. Um, there have definitely been processes that drive things down because there is evidence of them on the surface. But I, you know, I don't have a strong opinion that those should be regular uh, steady state processes and not periodic in time or have happened in the past um, or longer term processes related to like a decoupled ice shell. But yeah, it's hard to get done. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's one of the important points that we need to uh, put in our white paper is to understand uh, the ocean to surface uh, exchange mechanism to be more quantified or, or if there is no quantitative uh, model that one can do, what data is needed in order to quantify it. Because without that, uh, you know, we will be talking more or less. It's not uh, really quantification. Any more questions? Just to say about the clathrates, one comment. I don't know too much work that's been done on some of that for my own field, but uh, one of the problems is the clathrates are crystalline material, and radiation tends to destroy crystallinity. And so I think people kind of stayed away from it. I, I don't know the rate at which this would happen. You know, you can look it up for water and things like that, but. But uh, radiation is, uh, whatever the word is, just uh, really bad for clathrates. Destroys the evidence. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, OK, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the, sorry to say that about, about clathrates, there is so much of confusion. And every kind of definition is given to that. From uh, high pressure clathrates, like what you have in, uh, you know, uh, on Earth's uh, you know, ocean, or, or potentially could be also in Europa, to any trapped species in even amorphous ice, or between crystalline you know, cavities and things like that. So the word clathrates is so loosely used that one should be very careful. And uh, I think we, we started saying that everything should be taken with a grain of. Uh, uh, grapefruit. <laughs> grapefruit. Okay. Grain of uh, citric acid or salt. Okay. So uh, we have a lot of time to discuss or time to take a break. I, I have an anecdotal thing to relate. Um, I was inspired by this McKinnon and Zelensky paper a lot. And, uh, and, um, I, I, I want to su suggest that anyone who has a rock band that they should name the band Salty Dogs of Europa. For some reason, McKinnon and Zelensky sounded like a, the names of band members to me. So, um, yeah. so Grapefruit Margarita. Salty Dogs salty of Europa. Dogs of, oh, good. We are getting really excited now. Yeah. I'm not going to let Murthy get ahead of me here. <laughs> so, so just uh, I'll, I'll second his comment about the clathrite thing. People tend to regard anything as trapped in in water sometimes. Clathrite is just sort of a sloppy use, and it's easy to fall into it. I've done it myself. But the other one is hydrate. You know, just yeah. because something is wet yeah. doesn't mean it's a hydrate. I don't know if that's common knowledge or not. But I hear people talk about wet samples, and they'll talk about them being hydrated, and that's not exactly what usually is meant by that. So I don't know. That's it. That's enough Good. comments from a curmudgeon, I guess. <laughs> it's coming there. Yeah. Okay. No, can't curmudgeon. Um, so, uh, how much does the pressure and temperature and time scale of vertical transport of something that's fell in, or frozen at the ice ocean interface affect your assumption for? your equilibrium freezing readjusting at every depth yeah um so the e equilibrium assumption is i think wrong um in um probably most cases but um this is where um investigations of the formation of sea ice will be important the other so i i, I i'm pessimistic about equilibrium um because then there are subsequent alteration processes that can occur even if things are deposited at equilibrium. 
And so um, it's, it was interesting to look at some of this, this work in the last couple of decades, uh, washout in multi, the few instances of multi-year sea ice, where there it also appears that things are, frac are um, uh, preferentially fractionated at all, although the washout seems to support this kind of uh, equilibrium Marian model in which um, uh, sulfates seem to be taken out. It's, and that seems intuitively um, appropriate to me, given the higher um, freezing point of sulfate-rich solutions relative to chlor chlorides. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, no, you. Uh, uh, I have a question, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, like the surface composition, we are now coming up with several possibilities. Uh, what is the, uh, let's say, uh, certainty of our, the lack thereof of uh, ocean composition that we are right now in and what do we need uh, in order to get a better idea about it? You're speaking of Europa's ocean composition? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I think um, all options are on the table. Uh, I, I wanted to emphasize this, this idea that it comes down to magnesium sulfate versus sodium chloride in the broad sense. Um, and in terms of what we need to do about it, this is a goal of the Europa Clipper. Um, you know, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out that the ocean probably tastes different than the surface. Nevertheless, um, by understanding the fractionation processes, we can we can begin to understand the ocean's composition. Also, if things are coming from um, from plumes or things that might more directly sample the the, the interior, then we have some hope. Um, maybe there are places on Europa where the surface is younger and more expressive of what's in the interior. So if uh, sulfur is endogenous as well as exogenous, is there any way that we can differentiate it uh, or on the surface? If, if, if the only way to get sulfur to the surface is as sulfate, it would seem that sulfur is most likely exogenous. So we, we won't be able to say about sulfur, endogenous sulfur by any kind of remote sensing observations. <laughs> No, this is your guess. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not taking you to a task on this. But yeah, no, that, that's that's what I would assert. You know, I, I hesitate. Well, I, I don't hesitate when you say uh, remote sensing. Uh, if if we're talking about you know uh, in situ sampling, maybe there's something with uh, isotopes, but I don't know. Just a quick follow up because you mentioned about Mike Jolansky paper and the institute sampling. So he, um, Mike Jolansky just published a new paper looking at the fluid inclusion inside highlight crystal of eight chondri. I think you probably saw the paper. But what's interesting to me is that uh, what they interpreted because the eight chondri were basically uh, experiencing a very heating thermal metamorphism. So they were interpreted in the paper that the eight chondri would come from the outer, from Sirius or the outer solar system. And they argue that uh, the fluid inclusion would be representative of the, you know, ocean war composition. I don't know how this would be relevant. What, what do you think about that? Oh, that, that's really interesting. I think we have had a brief conversation before, before my talk about this. Um, there's this cool paper by uh, Steve Desch and others uh, about Jupiter possibly being the, the the um, dividing line between uh, more terrestrial-like chondrites um, and and the um, the um, more volatile and rich materials, the the C ones, the really volatile stuff, is supposed uh, from the um, calcium aluminum inclusions um, to have formed even farther out. All of this, if all of this is is in is in the realm of of the games where you consider the chondrites and the oldest meteorites as the the uh, materials that most likely made up. Um, Europa or other, like th those were the formation materials, and they only were altered after they were incorporated into the Proto-Europa uh, or other ocean world. Um, there's the additional problem, though, that in addition to um, whatever um, evolution that Europa had, there was also the sub-nebula of Jupiter that might have fractionated things out. So we can ask whether there were places that retained volatiles in that sub-nebula, or there processes that um, shunted one kind of rock to one part of the sub-nebula or another. Um, so I'm interested in the Zelensky paper, but I'm pessimistic about the inclusion representing the composition of an ocean world.